all right, this is the uh, the lecture uh, for Micro 2 for the last week of February. Uh, I didn't do this on Tuesday. It's uh, I'm posting it a little bit late this week. Um, and uh, hopefully you've already uh, worked on Lab 5, but I'll talk a little bit about Lab 5. I did do a lab video for Lab 5, and I did post that. Uh, and so hopefully you watched that. That's in the laboratory section. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, so if we look at the syllabus, which I think I have pulled up here. Um, and it's over here. So if you look at the syllabus, you'll see that last week we were supposed to talk about tilt table calibration and a bunch, and introduction of the virtual project. And I'm going to do that next week. Um, so, uh, but I, so I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm just going to skip that for now and we'll go back and do that. We'll do that next week. Um, and next week was just a review and I'll probably push the test back a little bit. So um, I might even make just a, a review video that you can look at another time. And that way we'll kind of make up for the missed week. Um, so I'm going to cover timers and uh, uh, so uh, for the KL25Z today. And then uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about the lab, although I pretty much covered that in the lab video. Okay, so, so, um, all right. So, uh, as far as the tilt table goes, and I did want to say a couple things about it. So, the, uh, so we, there, there is a touch panel on top of the table, uh, and it can tilt with servo control. And actually, we have, um, there's a, here's a picture of it. So, we can actually show you there are there are two servos hopefully I can get these well okay so so on top we have and I I have some pictures maybe better than these but anyway so this is this is the, this is the touch panel that's the interface of the touch panel and it goes through this R, RJ45 plug and then it goes through this cable and plugs in here you have to be very careful this ribbon cable can be ripped off its attachment here all it has to do is just be bent enough and it, and it gets a crack and then the conductor is bad. Uh, that's a super vulnerable spot here, and I don't know. I, I probably should I probably should put some glue here, and try and get it done. I finally did. Somebody, one of the students suggested using super glue to glue the panel on, and I, that's what I did. So that's a yeah, that was a really great idea. And uh, so this panel is now super glued on. And before we had problems with the touch panels just falling off, and of course they ripped the cables or fell on the floor and broke or both. And so, um, one of the things we're going to do, we're uh, we're in the process of putting on these new interface boards with these voltage regulators. Although today I was trying to adjust the regulator and I couldn't adjust it, I'm, so I'm now I'm worried about the regulator. But in any event, uh, hopefully, hopefully we'll see. Um, hopefully these will work really well. I think they probably will, but I don't know. I'm I'm a little worried now. The first board that we did had a different regulator on it, and it totally failed. In fact, it had two regulators, and they just didn't work. Um, so now we're using this one, uh, and um, it's a little nicer. It does display the voltage for you, and so it's uh, it's got some nice features. In any event, this board has pins that plug in to your KL25Z, and, and we will provide uh, KL25Zs. And you can see there's, uh, there's uh, basically it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's like the Arduino shield thing. And it just plugs in. And so the, the touch panel connections come through this RJ45 plug. The power comes through this green port right down here, uh, which you can see there. And then the two, um, and then the two uh, servos plug in over here. Let's see if we can see this. Uh, yeah, they, they plug in right. Uh, I'm having trouble. Yeah, they plug in right here. And here are the wires to the two servos, and there's two plugs for the servos. It is important to get the servos plugged in correctly. If you plug them in backwards, it could cause problems. Um, so uh, you could short out the uh, uh, the signal. And uh, so the ground goes the ground goes on uh, the ground goes on on the right side. And uh, there, and I I'm a little fuzzy about X and Y, and in fact it it we'll have to make sure we get that right. Um, we are putting on new servo horns, these little blue things. We used to use plastic ones, and now these are metal, and they also uh, clamp to the shaft as well as have a screw. So that's really, and teeth, and so that's really nice. 
and then we have a little push rod here which is adjustable it's a little screw and you can turn those end pieces and when you turn the end pieces you can make the rod longer or shorter now some of them are maxed out and uh, there's one on each side and the one over here too and what we want to do is in the neutral position when the shaft is horizontal we want the tilt table to be level as best we can with the base anyway um, and uh, and then the whole thing is supported here on this universal joint now the universal joint has uh, two spikes that go into it and you have to have enough space in between uh, the spikes for the for the universal joint to move freely if you shove the spikes all the way in you can actually obliterate the space particularly the bottom spike the top spike is limited in its length uh, and each then one if you look really closely you will see that uh, that there's a little uh, set screw uh, the one for the bottoms here and the one for the top is hidden by these wires right now uh, Let's see if I can pull these away. Uh, anyway, it's you can barely see it, but it's there. And there's a little teeny um, wrench which um, allows those to be tightened. And they have to be tight because if they're tight, then the, then the tilt table will have very minimal minimal play. That's about all it should have. And if it, if they're loose and the and the attachments on the sides aren't set up correct, then the thing can be super wobbly and just not really useful. But but when it's when it's pretty good, it's it's it doesn't ro it doesn't uh, rotate much, and it just it just moves up and down in in one axis and up and down in the other axis uh, with the uh, with the servo arms. Let's see. In, in the, yeah, I guess that's bottom. Anyway. Yeah, I think there's a problem. I'll have to work on that a little bit. But anyway, so yeah, yeah. I guess that's as far as it's going because it gets in a bind there. But we'll work on that. Um, yeah. Anyway, there are things I can do to fix that, and I will do them, and uh, we'll be okay. All right. So anyway, so we're going to get these all set up. I was hoping to have them before spring break. Uh, but and I might have some ready to go. Uh, so if some of you want to try and check them out before spring break, we can probably do that next week. Um, but probably that's not gonna. Probably I won't have them all. So I would like it for. Um, so I'm hoping to have most of the code set up for you, but I'm in the process of doing that with the new IDE. It's a little bit of a. It's a pretty big project, and I'm working on it. So. Hopefully, uh, I'll get that done. I may not get it done until after spring break, in which case uh, you'll have to really get started after spring break. Um, but basically, what I plan on doing is giving you the, uh, the basic shell program, which will read the touch panel and, and give you commands for the servos. So you can get where, where the ball is on the, on the touch panel, and you can send an output to the servos to control them and that's so I want to have that code in place and maybe some other features too and hopefully most of that stuff will be done uh, will be interrupt driven in any event you'll still need to write uh, the controller code and I guess you can't see because I moved this over here oh yeah you're fine uh, anyway the uh, so the controller code oops and um, so hopefully all you'll have to do is write a little PID controller and you'll actually have dual axis so you'll have a controller for each axis and you'll uh, you'll have to, to to write that software well first you'll have to take your touch panel and calibrate it and we'll talk about that in the in the lecture next week uh, I might cover that a little bit today but we'll, we'll demonstrate it next week I'll actually calibrate my touch panel for you and uh, the way that works it's uh, it's a little bit confusing but basically We'll go. We'll use MATLAB. We'll take samples. I have several examples here, and then we'll put these. We'll do a little matrix equation, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll take uh, we'll take a transpose. We'll take the inverse of the transpose times the original matrix, and then we'll uh, multiply that by the by the transpose, and then we'll multiply that by the the input vector, and that'll give us these two equations, uh, x correction and y correction, 
which will have, there'll be uh, three constants for each equation. Uh, we'll have a, a, something we multiply by the x-axis value and the y-axis value, and then we'll add a fixed constant to it, and we'll do that for both axes, for the x value and the y value. And uh, those, will tr those, those equations then, once we go through this calibration process, will, uh, it, will it, what it does, it's doing a, with this linear algebra, it's doing a least, uh, it's doing a least squares fit uh, of these points to correct for translation, rotation, and scaling. And uh, so it's pretty cool, uh, and we'll show you how to do that because the uh, there are rotational tra clearly there tr there are scaling errors, uh, but there's also translational rotation errors. And we'll go over that next week, and hopefully get, get you up to speed. So if you have your if you've taken linear algebra, you might want to review it. Uh, it'll help maybe help a little bit, but we'll cover what you need to know. Um, so basically, you'll you'll be required to kind of write the controller. And then, and then basically provide the calibration uh, to basically tune it so that it balances the ball. And we'll give you some hints on how to do that, and you can work with it. Um, and hopefully, then somewhere on April 22nd and 23rd, that Thursday, the 22nd or Friday, the 23rd, we'll 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 have hopefully groups uh, come into the lab and uh, demonstrate their their tilt table solution, and we'll see how long they can balance the ball, and we'll have a couple of other tests to see how well it catches a ball and uh, whatnot. And uh, so we'll see. And, and then uh, the winner will, uh, uh, the, the, the best group will, will, will have first, second, third place, and we might even come up with a little prize money or something, we'll see. Um, okay, um, all right, so uh, I'm currently working on uh, adjusting the servo mounts, uh, the, p putting on the new servo arms, adjusting the push rods, upgrading the interface board, uh, putting on the new voltage regulators and getting them adjusted, and then uh, making sure the tables level when the rod, when the level when the arms are in mid position, and then verifying that all the servos are functional and replacing out, swapping out bad servos for good servos. So all these things are uh, pretty doable, uh, and I hope to have. A, a, a bunch of servos, a bunch of tilt tables ready to go. Hopefully a few at the end of next week and, and then all of them by the end of spring break. Uh, we have a total of 18 of them and we could have up to 18 groups. Uh, but if you don't want to do it, if you don't want to come into lab uh, and all that, then that's fine. Um, uh, then you can do the virtual project and we'll talk about that. Um, probably, I'll probably talk about it a little bit next week as well. And, and then we'll bring up, we'll begin all this, uh, special project stuff in earnest after spring break, and that's pretty much what we'll do for the remainder of the course. Okay. Uh, you, can take the, the, you can take the tilt tables home, and all I ask is you to be really, really careful with the, uh, with the touch panel. Uh, I think uh, using the, uh, um, uh, using the, uh, 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 the, super, the super glue uh, is actually, was a great idea, and uh, I guess it was inspired by that lady who uh, super glued her hair. <laughs> so apparently she had to go to the operating room and have that worked on in the, in the operating room under anesthesia. Oh, truly amazing. Anyway, uh, so perhaps inspired by the lady that super glued her hair this last, I guess, a couple weeks ago, whenever that was. Uh, but in any event, uh, it seems to be working great, and I think that's going to give us a level of safety we've never had. One of the problems with the touch panels is uh, if you, you can't tape them down very well because if you tape them too much then you destroy the touch function uh, because you create a touch where you put the tape uh, so you kind of have to secure them by their bottom and normally that's done with a little bezel that goes over the touch panel uh, just like a normal computer touch screen there's a little metal bezel that goes over it and holds everything in place and uh, it only works on the edges and leaves all the touch surface unencumbered but uh, we didn't really have metal bezels for this, and um, so. But uh, I think the, it looks like the uh, super glue is going to work great. So I'm very excited about that. Okay, um, and so you can have a group of any size you want, up to maybe five or even six students. Although, you know, whatever. But uh, but even you know one or two students can be a group if you want to do it that way. All right, 
again, as long as we can't have more than 18 groups, that's the only re restriction. Okay, uh, I think that's all I wanted to say about the tilt tables. Let's talk about the timers. So, um, so I want you. To, so I kind of want you to just have a, a little bit of a feel for the timers that are available uh, in in on the KL25Z. Unlike the PIC, where we had timer zero, timer one, and timer two, four, and six, and only timer one was a 16-bit timer, and the others were all 8-bit timers. So they did have prescalers, and some had postscalers and prescalers, so that you could get more than you know 256 counts, but they they just really weren't as powerful as uh, as 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 what's on the KL25Z. The KL25Z has a whole bunch of of 16-bit counters, 32-bit counters. It's even got the ability uh, to put two 32-bit registers together for. I think you can do a 64-bit counter, and uh, it's called a forever counter. And you you can imagine when you get up to 64 bits, that's a lot. Of, that's a big number. And that that takes an awful lot of ticks. Uh, even at even at megahertz rates, it takes a lot of ticks, a lot of ticks. So um, uh, so it's pretty amazing. Um, the timers have count up, count down features, and a whole bunch. And then many of the modules have their own timers. We will cover the the timers for the TPM module, which is basically the PWM module. We'll talk about that. Um, and I may try and do a, a timer lab next week. I'm, I'm thinking about that right now. I think maybe we'll try and do that. We'll see. Um, and if we do that, uh, we'll, we may use one of the low power timers or I don't know. We'll do something. We'll see. Hopefully we can set that up. All right. Um, so this is a typical example of a timer. This actually is kind of just a basic structure. Uh, I think this is timer zero from the pick, but it's the same idea. And you have external pins that can that can uh, tick the timer. You have um, you have uh, uh, some other internal sources. In this case, on the pick, you have a touch sensing module input. Uh, then you have your system clock coming in that can also drive your timer. And then you you do have this synchronizing circuit, um, and uh, you need that when you have an external input so that you don't get uh, uh, funky meta states and stuff like that. Eventually, you do have to. There has to be. There typically has to be some synchronizing in order to not let an external uh, uh, clock, uh, an external signal edge, uh, cause havoc with the uh, w trying to read it at just the wrong time. So there always has to be a little bit of synchronization circuitry. And then here's our eight bits, and we can usually write and read it. We can write it to whatever a value we want, and then it counts up. And when it hits uh, FF, it overflows and sets a flag uh, for a, for a uh, um, for a uh, uh, an interrupt possibly, or a, a flag that you can just pull on if you're not using interrupts. The flag gets set whether you're using interrupts or not. You have to enable interrupts if you're using interrupts. And then here we have a prescaler that picks uh, that picks which which of the eight bit prescale values is utilized here, and then. Um, Yeah, and then here we select from whether we're going to use the prescaler or just the straight oscillator clock or how that's going to work, or the external clock or whatever. All right, so there are a lot of things that you can use timers for. Obviously, you've already used them for to get a delay, so you could adjust uh, your blinking LED and make it uh, and uh, and use that. We did that in Micro One, and then we also used. Uh, a timer to create an interrupt in Micro One. So every time the timer overflowed, it created an interrupt. Uh, and we definitely have timers like that in in our uh, in in on this chip. Uh, in addition to that, we have some. Uh, we even have an internal timer that can be used by the system uh, to basically give time slices to different applications if you have a a, a real time operating system running an RTOS running. Um, uh, and uh, you can also have a real-time clock with a forever timer. You can have all sorts of interesting clocks, um, and uh, you can count external pulses instead of uh, instead of driving it with a clock. You can drive it with an external pin, and every time the pin uh, uh, has a rising edge, you can count it, and uh, and in that way you can count external pulses. 
So I guess in theory, you can have a, a push button someplace and every time, you know, uh, somebody walks through a turnstile, it could trigger that push button and you could count, you know, how many people went through the turnstile or whatever. Uh, so a timer can be used as a simple counter too. And then it can also be used to, to, to control your PWM period and duty cycle. And uh, so those are some typical applications. Um, well, like uh, you all know the ping sensor uh, measures distance ultrasonically and you want to measure the time interval between when you uh, when the pulse goes high and then when it goes low that tells you the time of flight and you just divide that time by two and that gives you the time and then you use the speed of sound to calculate the distance um, and a timer can make that can automate that for you so you don't you know you don't your code doesn't have to pull on the ping sensor line that it can directly drive the timer and the timer can capture that information for you and uh, and that's that's a function of these modules these these uh these timer and PWM modules and, and on this chip they call them TPM modules and on our other chip uh, on the KL on the PIC chip they were CCP capture uh, compare and PWM and the capture was capture the the uh, the, the, the number of ticks on a line like external pulses and the compare would be to compare uh, a, uh, a pulse width uh, to, an, to an internal um, standard and see wh whether it's longer or shorter or longer. All right, um, so we're going to talk about four timers. There are more timers than that on this chip uh, and of course there's a whole clock module that generates all sorts of uh, system clocks, some of which can go to modules, or, or many of which can go to modules. So the four timers we'll talk about um, in just a second. There are, uh, the touch sensing module has its own timers, uh, the serial communication uh, clocks have their own, uh, 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 have their own uh, timers to set the baud rate for the UART, to set the, uh, the, the uh, some of the clocks for I squared C or SPI. Um, so there are also some timers uh, that are used in the very low power states when the chip's mostly asleep uh, and that way it can it can wake up when a timer overflows and there are also as I mentioned if you want it, if you have a real-time operating system the RTOS can use uh, a couple of uh, uh, either the system tick timer or the pit timer which we'll talk about in a minute uh, to time slice uh, application so that every application gets a little bit of time. All right, so first we're going to talk about uh, the, the PWM module timer, and uh, then we'll talk about the periodic interrupt timer that you might use with an RTOS, for instance. Then we'll talk about the low power timer, uh, and we'll talk about the real time clock. Um, and most of these involve several timers. Um, all right, so the TPN timer, uh, basically it's a simple timer that supports this, uh, t this, uh, this TPM module. So it can be used for PWM, it can also be used for uh, measuring pulse widths on external signals and things like that. Um, and you can have, a, you can have there are a number of clock modes. They can increment on every edge of an asynchronous counter clock. They can increment on just the rising edge of an external clock input synchronized to the asynchronous counter clock. Remember, you have to, when you use an external pin, you have to you have to sync it with something. You can have a prescaler of one, two, all the way up to one twenty eight. It uses a sixteen bit counter, and it can be a free running counter or a modulo counter. It can be an up or an up down counter. Uh, the up down feature is very useful for when we want to do um, when we want to do uh, uh, center justified PWM. Uh, on the PIC, the only thing we could do is edge aligned PWM, but on this chip we can also do center aligned PWM, and it's this up down feature that allows that. And without spending a lot of time on that, the the difference is if you think about it, if you have a if you have a signal, so um, the edge aligned at the beginning of every PWM cycle, the 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 uh, the PWM output then would always be high, and then when the duty cycle was over, it would immediately go low and then the rest of the time would expire and you start the process over. So, so in any, all the windows of your PWM have the, sh have the same exact shape. Um, 
but uh, but in but the the uh, the high time of the duty cycle is always starts at the beginning of each window. Whereas if you have center aligned, the the window is centered in in the 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 high time for the duty cycle is centered in the middle of the window always. So you start your you start your timing period and it starts low and then say if it's if it's a 50% duty cycle at 25% of the period it would go high, it would stay high to 75% and then it would go low and then finish out the last 25 low. And if you look at it on the scope, you, you have to have a second channel to kind of kind of get it edge aligned correctly because uh, otherwise it'll still look edge aligned. Uh, but if you do it that way with the second channel, you'll see that, that as you change your pulse width, it, it's always centered in the window. It's not at one edge. Uh, so uh, it's a little tricky. I don't even know how to display it on the scope to make that work. But, um, but anyway, uh, you have to have it triggered with the beginning of the cycle. I guess you could do that by looking at by triggering it with the flag. So that's what you could do. Uh, and so why do we care? Why would we go to that trouble? Well, the reason is that uh, as you change your PWM period, remember it's basically a square wave. And uh, so there's some high frequency components to make it a nice square wave. And uh, there's more uh, spurious, you know, high frequency emissions uh, that can cause interference with other things when you use edge aligned versus center aligned. When you change a center aligned duty cycle, it doesn't generate as much noise as when you change an edge aligned duty cycle. So that's that's the reason for it. Uh, and any any real advanced uh, PWM uh, module will have the uh, center center uh, aligned feature if it's you know if it's you know pretty advanced. Um, but you can certainly get by with edge aligned, and that's that's all we even have in the pick. All right. Um, so the uh, so there are three modules on the KL25Z. I left out the K here. Um, with and the they can have up to six channels. Only the first module zero has six channels. Module one has two channels, and module two has two channels. So there so there's a total of ten channels. Uh, in three different modules, um, and I think I think that uh, for all intents and purposes, the clock frequency is the same for all the channels. But but with three modules, you can have three different three different clocks, um, and you can do you can do input capture if you're doing the capture mode on rising edge, falling edge, or both edges. And your output compare can have, uh, you can have the output signal can be set when it when it's uh, when it compares. It can be cleared when it when it compares. It can it can be uh, pulsed or toggled on on a on a on a match. So there's a lot of different a lot of different ways you can you can set up the output. And um, your PWN can be edge aligned or center aligned. You can also uh, use DMA requests. Um, when the counter overflows, and then there's a whole bunch of different trigger inputs you can use. Um, okay, uh, and here's a diagram. You can see that we have um, so we the module is disabled in this setting, and then here you use the module clock, and then here you can use an external clock. And again, note they run the external clock through a synchronizer, and the reason they do that is they don't want uh, signals on the chip that are not synchronized with the with the system clock, so that you don't uh, have something changing right as you're trying to read it and and trigger a meta state and you know cause things to to cause some problems. So that can cause you know some erratic behavior if you don't synchronize your external signals. Then you have a prescaler. Then you have uh, this modulo counter uh, where it counts up to a certain number, resets, counts up to a certain number, resets. Or whatever, and then you have your ch different channels, and this modulo counter signal goes out to these different channels, and uh, then you can have uh, uh, you can have edge aligned and level select bits um, for the in for input capture, uh, or you can also have you can generate the the output so that it's uh, so that it's uh, it can be driving a PWM signal or whatever, so.
Um, okay, and there can be up to six of these for each uh, for each um, each 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 module. All right, and then we have um, then we have this uh, the registers that are that are used, and you can see we have TPM zero, uh, and we have TPM one, and we have TPM two, and these are all the control registers for these. Uh, this one has uh, some uh, channel status and control registers as well. It has uh, status uh, channel channel zero status and control, channel one status and control, channel two, channel three, channel four, channel five. So that's six zero through five. But our other ones, um, our TPM one and two, ha have those registers provided, but they're actually only channels uh, zero and one are implemented. So only two channels uh, in for TPM1 and TPM2. But all six are implemented for TPM0. And uh, I won't go over this too much, uh, but but here's how you select the different uh, modes and edge, mode select, and then edge or level select. And and that's what uh, that's what the these bits have to do with. Um, all right. And so they, they have, and here's where we're going to use our edge line PWM. All right, we also have the periodic interrupt timer. So uh, don't confuse this with the system tick timer. The system tick timer is actually part of the ARM core. Um, so it's a little different. And you have to go get the ARM manual to figure out how to make it work. Um, the system, the, the periodic interrupt timer is, is one of the modules, and uh, and this can be done, used to do a whole bunch of different things. Uh, trigger DMA channels, raise interrupts, uh, and uh, it can have, uh, you can you can set up whole, you can set up independent timeout periods for each timer. So there's no external pins on this, on this pit, on the pit timer. It's only used for internal Synchronization and control, um, and the uh, we have this uh, this pit lifetime timer mode, uh, and what this does, it has a pit timer zero and pit timer one can be chained together, and it can build you a 64-bit, uh, as I called it, a forever timer, but it, I guess they call it a lifetimer here. Uh, the timers generate triggers at periodic intervals when they're enabled. And the timers load the start values as specified in, in their uh, in their load value register. They count down to zero, and then they load the respective start value again. Each time a timer reaches zero, it generates a trigger pulse and it sets the interrupt flag. Now, if you don't have interrupts enabled, it won't cause an interrupt. But you can check the flag and pull on the flag, or you can or you can actually use interrupts. And here here are the registers that that uh, control the, uh, the the pit the pit timer memory map. And um, and you have, you see, you have load values. You have these uh, lifetime. This is the 64-bit where you chain two together, um, and you have the master, kind of the master module control up here. And then you have your control registers for uh, for the zero timer, and for the the one timer. Uh, so you have two timers, um, each with four registers associated with its function. Um, and these these can these do work well. Oh, sorry, we switched a little. So, anyways, that's the pit timer. All right, we also have what's called low power timers. Low power timers uh, can operate uh, with a free with a prescaler. You can also uh, count external pulses, and you can have an optional glitch filter to uh, filter out uh, some high frequency noise, so you don't count that instead. Um, these low power timers can run across all power modes. In, in the very low leakage modes. So this is this can be the timer that you set to wake you up from the, the deepest of sleep. And there, there are four control registers um, and it has an external pin that can be assigned. And here, here are basically our, 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 our sleep modes. Run, wait, stop, low leakage, and then there's a debug mode. Now, um, so the low power timer uh, it is a 16-bit timer. Uh, it does have uh, the ability to interrupt, and again, it can do this asynchronous wake up from very low, very low, deep sleep modes. Uh, there's a hardware trigger output 
So you can use the low power timer to trigger some external uh, uh, device. And, uh, and again, you can do free running mode or it can reset on compares uh, with a given register. Um, and then you can configure the clock source. There are a number of different clock sources. Um, and you can configure your input source if you're counting input pulses. And it can work on rising or falling edge. And here's some of the registers, that the four registers that control it. Controller status, prescaler, compare, and counter register. Um, so you can clock this timer with one of four clocks. And the prescaler uh, works by uh, when the timer is being clocked by the select the clock, and it can divide it by anywhere from 2 to the second to 2 to the 64th. So huge prescaler. The real time clock is, uh, is the final timer we'll talk about. And basically, it has a 32 bit seconds counter with rollover protection and 32 bit alarm. So if you actually do count up to, to 4 giga, you know, 4 billion, 4 some odd billion seconds, then it'll give you an alarm and tell you it just rolled over. And I think 4 billion seconds is something like um, a little over 10 or 11 years, something like that. I believe that's what uh, what's, goes on in the, uh, in the in at least the, uh, the the early GPS satellites. I don't know if they've left that in the new ones or not. But in the old ones, they, their internal timer, I think, was 32 bits. And every 10 or 11 years, it would roll over. And uh, the first time it did it, there was a lot of anxiety about how that was going to work. But it, it seems to not be a big problem. Um, you do have an internal, uh, uh, you have a 16-bit prescaler, and you have compensation uh, registers that can adjust between 0.12 parts per million and almost 4,000 parts per million uh, to get the get our get the internal clock the the the, the real time clocks uh, driven by this internal um, oscillator and this will let you adjust that and then finally there's this uh, you can do register protection uh, the nice thing is you can you can lock these because you want it to keep real time so you don't want it to get reset every time there's a software reset so what what you can do is you can uh, you can lock these power on register. The, you can you can uh, initialize it when it powers on, and then you can lock these registers so that so that there's no way to access it after after it's initially written. And it also has a one hertz square wave output. Uh, and here here are the various registers. Um, so it has the second the 32 bit seconds register, the prescaler, uh, and then an alarm register, uh, the compensation register to fine tune. Uh, to make sure it's counting exactly like the way you want. And then uh, it's got a control and status. And then this is the lock register and the interrupt enable stuff. Uh, it's driven by, it can be driven by, there's a built-in 32.768 kilohertz crystal. Uh, and that crystal can then produce the real-time clock pulses. All right, I think that's uh, pretty much what I wanted to cover. Um, uh, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, maybe I'll just take a little bit of time, let's see, and uh, talk about the, um, the tilt table just a little bit. So let's do that. All right, so, so just to kind of go through this, uh, oops, get rid of this. So just to kind of go through this, the tilt table, the touch panel, uh, it's, this is similar, it's not identical to ours because ours mounts on the center, but it's the same idea. You have, you have, two, you have two pieces. You have, a, you have a top piece of glass, and then you have this little, this little teeny spacer dots that are in here. And it may, it, some, in some cases they're around the side. Uh, sometimes they put little dots across the whole surface. Um, and then you have the back piece of glass, the bottom glass, and the bottom glass is is uh, pretty stiff, but the top glass is a little more flexible. And so when you push on the top, it'll it actually will make contact. And both the under surface of the top and the top surface of the bottom have uh, resistive coatings on them. And these re these coatings are connected to this flexible tail. And so the tail has electrodes to give you. Um, 
to give you two electrodes on the sides for the bottom panel resistive coating and uh, or yeah and then two electrodes on the top and bottom which get connected through these pads to the uh, so that you can, so that you basically have um, essentially you have the ability to apply uh, you know 3.3 volts here and ground there so you have you have a voltage divider continuous voltage divider here and then you can uh, you can use you can turn the, the voltage off on the uh, say the x-axis here and you can connect one of those electrodes to your uh, to your analog input your A to D converter and you can read the voltage so if you touched it right in the middle and you had 3.3 volts then you'd expect what 1.65 volts or something like that uh, so uh, so and if you touch it at one end you'd expect 3.3 and the other end you'd expect zero and of course going through the A to D converter that's going to be converted into a, a digital value and we'll, we'll probably use it's a, it is a 16 bit A to D converter but we'll, we'll probably only use um, probably 12 bits uh, so we'll, we'll go up to 4096 uh, 0 to 4096 so 4096 would represent 3.3 volts and 0 would represent ground and something around 2000 would be you know somewhere near the middle um, and and that's true for each axis so then you, you do it for one axis and then you flip it around you uh, you turn off the voltage here you tri-state these and then you also have another one connected that connects it to the A to D converter on a, on a different channel and then you put power and, and ground across this panel and then wherever it's touched you can sense the voltage the, the, you can sense the X voltage here or the Y voltage up here and that gives you your XY coordinate and you switch those back and forth you know maybe at a rate of uh, a, 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 you know several thousand times a second and that's how you uh, uh, that's that's how you read the touch panel um, you can see here you have just this little bitty spacing dots and when you when you touch when you touch here it makes a contact between the the top resistive coating and the bottom resistive coating now you because you don't you're not running a voltage say with say you you have 3.3 here ground there but on this one you're not putting any you, you've got the 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 the, the GPIO pins connected to it or tri-stated so they're floating and you have uh, and then you hook one of these up one of these uh, sensing pads up to a, your A to D converter because there is a little bit of resistance from where you make that touch on the bottom pad too but when you because the A to D converter is very high impedance there's 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 very little voltage drop across that uh, because there's very very little current running and and so it gives you a, a very accurate a pretty reasonably good measurement of this top panel all right um, so you can think of it like this you've got four resistors here and when you touch it uh, you're measuring one voltage divider by connecting by not powering the other one and connecting it to the A to D converter and then you flip that around you power the one you uh, you, you take the power off the one you were powering tri-state it and connect it to the A to D converter and meanwhile you power put power and ground on the other uh, voltage divider and then you're measuring the X voltage and first you measure the Y then you measure the X or vice versa if you turn the touch panel upside down it doesn't work very well because this this back glass base doesn't flex very much just this this front face uh, uh, flexible coating I think it's kind of glassoid because it, it looks like it cracks so I don't know they call it a film uh, there are flexible touch panels too you can get that are not made out of glass but um, the glass ones are a little more accurate I think all right so that gives you a little bit of an idea how the touch panel works and once we get that information then we know where the ball is uh, and if we can compare it with some previous information we know how fast the ball is moving in on each axis and so we can we can use the, that information the first order and second order uh, information to drive our, our PID controller so we have a we have a proportional input based on just where the ball is but we have a differential input based on 
on uh, how how fast it's moving. And then we we have we also do an integral uh, correction that basically uh, is what corrects for our steady state error. Uh, if you if we uh, if, if the table's not totally level, there, there'll be a little built-in steady state error. And if you have an integral, a small amount of integral, uh, over time you'll correct that steady state error and get the ball back in the center, even if, even if the tilt table's a little uh, uh, off the level, uh, because it still wants to zero out the ball. But if you don't have that integral feature, then, it, then the, the proportion on the differential can never get the ball exactly in the center uh, unless the table's exactly flat. Otherwise, you have that built-in um, that built-in uh, angle, and that 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 will cause a steady-state error that you can't correct with just the P and D parts. Okay, so I don't think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna. I think I'll stop with that. Uh, I'll post this video, and um, and then uh, make sure you try and get caught up. Um, the I didn't I didn't post a video for a lab next week, so we'll basically. Uh, We'll just have to catch that up. Um, well, we don't really. It's not going to really be a problem. I, I think we'll just do one more lab next week, and that'll be all the labs we'll do, except for the final project. Um, all right. So let me know if you have questions, and otherwise, I'll put this video up, and I'll do a little quiz to go with it.